Right now, in the state of Massachusetts, it is against the law for any person to stand within 35 feet of the entrance to any health clinic that provides abortions, provided that person is not trying to enter the facility. It's a law that was enacted in 2007 in response to years of relentless intimidation, harassment, and sometimes deadly violence directed at women entering these clinics. But by the looks of it, this law, this protection, may not be around for much longer. This morning, after hearing arguments on Massachusetts' so-called buffer zone, the Supreme Court seemed poised to strike it down. Specifically, the court is arguing over a 35-foot-wide area that exists in front of a health clinic, the space between that yellow line and the building, a space that is roughly the width of two parking spots. That space is what anti-choice activists claim is violating their First Amendment rights, a space that takes the average person about seven seconds to cross, a space that is one quarter the size of some of the buffer zones at polling places throughout the country, a space that is one-eighth the size of the buffer zone that surrounds, if you can believe it, the Supreme Court. According to anti-choice activists, that 35-foot space infringes on their right to free speech. The face of today's legislation is Eleanor McCullen, a 77-year-old anti-abortion activist who regularly plants herself outside Planned Parenthood in Boston. Barely five feet tall, McCullen says she poses no threat and that the buffer zone frustrates her attempts to talk to women entering the clinic. The thing is, buffer zones, like the ones in Massachusetts, weren't enacted because of peaceful, self-described grandmother types like Eleanor McCullen. Buffer zones were a response to over 4,700 incidents of clinic violence and over 140 clinic blockades that have occurred since 1995. Buffer zones were a response to the eight murders 17 attempted murders, 42 bombings, and 181 arson cases that have targeted women seeking abortions and the men and women who have provided them since 1977. That's why the buffer zone exists. But that violent, deadly history is not apparently something that Justice Antonin Scalia seems to remember. Following today's opening arguments, Scalia insisted that what protesters really want to do is engage in conversation, as he put it, in a friendly matter, not in a hostile way. Joining me now from Washington is the president of NARAL Pro-Choice America, Elise Hogue. Elise, Elise, thanks for joining us. I find all of these trend lines on reproductive freedoms deeply distressing, but as the Anti-Defamation League has said, anti-abortion violence, they have called it America's forgotten terrorism. Do you agree with that? I do, and I, I don't think it's, um, and you know, there's an intention to make Americans forget by putting people like Mrs. McCullen out in front. Um, as you read the litany of statistics, um, unfortunately, there is no way for Justice to, Scalia to know when there's going to be a Mrs. McCullen there or when there's going to be someone like Mr. Hill who gunned down Dr. Britton in Florida as he was entering the clinic that he served to take care of women who needed his services. That was not that long ago, and we do a real disservice to the memories of all of those who have been killed, threatened, and harassed when we allow Scalia to in infer motives of everyone that goes to these clinics. We get reports daily from clinic escorts and women who have tried to get in there about being spit on, being shoved off sidewalks into traffic. Um, this is not something of the past. In 2012, five clinics were burned to the ground through arson attempts uh, or arson events. So there is a concerted effort to shift the face, and we should not be fooled, and certainly the Supreme Court should not be fooled. Well, and at least, what do you make of uh, Justice Kagan's remarks uh, to today, I believe, about the 35-foot distance, that buffer zone? She said, 35 feet is a ways. Is it your thinking that they may just sm s uh, shorten the buffer zone, make it smaller, or that, that it may be done away with entirely? 
You know, it wasn't me, it was Aaron Carmone who mused that perhaps um, the Justice Kagan was actually thinking 35 yards. 35 feet is easy to hear people, easy to see people. There's nothing that prevents women who want to engage in conversation, want to take the literature from walking over there. Look, we have a long history in this country of protecting free speech, but we make exceptions all the time. And one of the primary exceptions we make is when public safety is at stake. Yeah. Military funerals have a buffer zone. There is a clear history of threats to public safety in this case, and it chills me to think about the message that the court would send if they show a tolerance for the kind of violence we've seen in the past at these clinic entrances. You know, I, but at least, if, you know, if we dig deeper, this, of course, isn't just about free speech. This is part of a broader effort and a broader Absolutely. movement to restrict reproductive freedoms and make the very terrible and difficult decision mm -hmm. to terminate a pregnancy that much more shameful and humiliating yeah. and degrading. I mean, if you, we have some charts here. Um, if you look at the number of states that have enacted anti-choice measures in the last year, or I think this is this one is even more disturbing. The cumulative number of statewide anti-choice measures enacted since 1995. Look at that increase. I mean, it is shocking. Mm -hmm. And I ask you. I mean, we try and decipher why this is happening and why now. And and I, I what do you think it is? Why why are we doing this to the women of America? America. You know, I think what we're seeing is the culmination of a multi-decade strategy by the, on the part of the extreme minority who actually had a many, many, many year plan to take over the state houses, to take advantage of redistricting and gain a foothold in Congress, to look at judicial appointments and nominees. And right now we're seeing the fruit of all of that labor. And you're absolutely right, there's a pattern here. What is really important for your viewers to understand is we're also seeing the tide shift. It will take a while for the pendulum to swing back. But look, we live in a pro-choice country. 70% of Americans believe that the rights enshrined in Roe are the right ones. This is a mainstream issue for most Americans, and Americans are waking up to the threat and we're starting to see the wind shift. So I think 2014, we're gonna see more offense on the part of the movement. We're gonna see more anti-choice legislators defeated at the ballot box. And um, you know, more ballot measures like we saw in Albuquerque go down. People understand the gravity of what's at risk. They understand that these anti-choice politicians are not just anti-abortion, they're anti-contraception. And really they're anti-women operating outside of any role other than the one that they see as the traditional family role. And that's not the diversity we brace in, in America. It, it's, not, it's not the reality for most American families. Yeah, and I think part of that is holding, as you said, uh, elected officials accountable today. Representative Bob Goodlot said during debate on a health, law, uh, health funding law that carrying pregnancies to term very, mo very much promotes job creation. Yeah, so now, absolutely. in some ways, having, the cho having choice is bad for the economy. I actually heard you talking to Representative Representative Ellison and I was thinking they don't want to get nothing done. They actually are obsessed with this one issue, which is so outside of the priorities of most Americans. And I think they're going to pay for it at the ballot box. We shall see. NARAL Pro-Choice America's Elise Hogue, always a pleasure seeing you. Thank you, Alex.